All right, good morning. You all had a chance to dry off and get some coffee. Uh, my name is Lauren Reese, and on behalf of my colleagues in the Maternal Health Initiative, it's my pleasure to welcome you to the Wilson Center this morning. Uh, I see some familiar faces in the room, but for those of you who haven't been to the Wilson Center, a quick word about where you're sitting. The Wilson Center is celebrating its 50th anniversary this year as a living memorial to President Wilson, uh, recognizing his connection to both policy and scholarship. We bridge the worlds of academia, practice, and policy. The Maternal Health Initiative works across these communities to link maternal, reproductive, and child health care to international development and foreign policy priorities. Today's event, Aligning the Stars for reproductive quali or, sorry, re Quality Reproductive Maternal Newborn and Child Health Care, it's mouthful, <laughs> RMNCH is much easier somehow, uh, marks the third and final event in a series we've partnered on with the USAID's flagship Maternal and Child Survival Program. Previous events focused on strengthening health systems and scaling up successful reproductive and maternal health interventions. If you miss those events or want to revisit them, you can do so through our blog, newsecuritybeat.org. For today's panel, we have an incredible lineup of speakers, some who have traveled the globe to be here with us. I'd like to give a special welcome and thank you to our panelists and moderators and recognize Charlene Reynolds, Holly O'Hara, and Kathleen Hill from MCSP for their support in pulling together today's event. A quick note about uh, how the event will flow today. We have two sections, two different panels. Uh, there will be a quick transition between the panels, and I ask for you to remain in your seat so that we can do it as quickly as possible so that we don't take away from the discussion. Each uh, section of the event will have its own Q&A, so please have your questions ready. We'll have colleagues in the audience with microphones, and we ask that you uh, give your name and affiliation before getting quickly to your question. Uh, for those of you in the overflow space, I don't know that we have one just yet, but I imagine by 15 minutes after the hour we will. Uh, please write your questions on paper provided and hand them to the designated staff in the room. Uh, to kick off the panels, I'd like to introduce Chantelle Allen, who will moderate the first panel. Chantelle is a senior technical advisor with MCSP and has more than 15 years of field experience in leading and managing diverse health programs in developing and conflict conflict-affected countries in Africa and Asia. Chantel, I turn it over to you. Thank you, Lauren. Good morning, everybody. I don't know where all of you are from, but where I'm from, rain is actually very auspicious and a sign of good luck. <laughs> so I feel very happy that it's raining this morning. So to, without further ado, to get started this morning, we're gonna ask Barbara Hughes, um, to come up and open our seminar and give her opening remarks. Barbara Hughes is the Director of Maternal Child Health and Nutrition Office and USAID's Bureau for Global Health. Thank you, Barbara. Good morning and thank you uh, for having me here. I feel like I know 50 percent of the people in the audience. <laughs> We've worked together at one point or another over the last years, including people on the panel who I've worked with in a variety of countries. Um, so what I thought I would do with my remarks is, is just, just set the stage. Um, I will give you the heads up that I'm not going to say anything that you don't already know and believe in, but let's just frame, frame where we are. So I would like to thank the Wood Woodrow Wilson Center and MCSP for bringing all of us together today as we discuss what it takes and to improve and sustain high quality reproductive maternal newborn and child health care at scale. The at scale port part is important. At USAID, we believe that nations have the opportunity to develop and prosper when people are healthy. Access to quality health services should not be a barrier in whether or not a woman survives childbirth or a child makes it to their fifth birthday. Healthcare systems must be accessible to all, especially the most vulnerable and underserved populations, in a way that meets their needs. USAID's investment in, in health focus on sh shifting the trajectory of a country's efforts so that our presence has contributed to helping to change their path. Within the health sector, USAID aims to build capacity and reduce disease burden while strengthening health systems to the point where countries are able to plan, fund, and manage their own continued progress toward resilient health systems. By partnering with countries on their journey to self-reliance, this is the new USAID buzzword, if you don't know it, you should, 
it's an important buzzword, and it's one I know that everybody agrees with. We're starting to talk about it more specifically in this, in this age. Uh, by partnering with countries on their journey to self-reliance, our investments pay dividends now and in the future as we are working ourselves out of a business. I encourage you to learn more about how we partner with countries on their journey to self-reliance, and one excellent reference for that is our 2018 Acting on the Call report, which I don't know if we have copies of here, but it is available online. Improving quality is imperative to building strong, resilient health systems in that quality services are more effective and more sustainable. If we are addressing or discussing quality care for all, we have to ensure that services are safe, effective, timely, respectful, coordinated, and equitable, among other things. It's doing the right thing at the right time and place for every person every time. Quality improvement approaches must be responsive to families' health needs and aligned with country priorities, structures, and local assets. For all those reasons, sustaining gains in quality improvement is truly everyone's business. Countries are making and sustaining gains in quality of care through many efforts, including strengthened leadership and health worker skills, better measurement and use of health data, and greater community engagement. We are seeing national governments commit and recommit to quality improvement. We work with national governments to update their national RMNCH guidelines based on global evidence and equip their frontline health workers, including health managers, mm -hmm. providers, and community health workers with the tools and resources needed to not only institutionalize quality improvement methods, but ensure the provision of consistently high quality care to improve patient outcomes. USAID has long supported countries to improve their quality of reproductive maternal, newborn, and child health care as an important part of presenting child and maternal deaths. We're pleased that the World Health Organization has initiated a quality of care network to harmonize and standardize multiple efforts to improve the quality of health care. We've been engaged in the development and implementation of the network activities from the very beginning at both the global and country level. I'm very excited for today's discussion where we will hear from countries sharing their own learning and experiences improving quality in health care and of their ongoing commitment to continuous improvement. And I hope they'll also share with us some of the challenges they're facing and how they are thinking about those challenges. Quality improvement requires measurable, clear aims focused on health outcomes and what matters to clients. We know that protecting women and children from basic illness and ensuring access to primary health services is the first step to building strong families, stable communities, and productive nations. By helping countries meet the needs of their women and children, USAID support is yielding immediate returns now in the form of improved health services and health outcomes and lasting returns in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Barbara. I'm sure you will agree with me that this has definitely been the year for a spotlight on quality. In the last couple of months alone, we've had reports and significant powerful recommendations of how to take our, word wor our work forward in this global context. So we'd now like to ask Kathleen to help us frame our work and the seminar within this global context. Dr. Kathleen is the maternal health team lead at USAID's flagship maternal and child survival program. In addition, Kathleen leads the, provides leadership to the quality efforts at MCSP, and today's event and the MCSP work that we will highlight are a true testament to Kathleen's leadership, her wisdom, her many years of experience, and her personal passion for ensuring that we achieve quality for all. Kathleen, thank you for your thought leadership. Over to you. Thank you very much, Chantal. Good morning and a warm welcome to all of you. It's my pleasure to offer framing remarks for today's seminar on quality of RMNCH care. I think I'll just use the abbreviation if you don't mind because we want to be very inclusive, but stay within time. On behalf of the USAID Maternal Child Survival Program, I would like to thank the Wilson Center for co-hosting this event. The Wilson Center has been a wonderful partner to us and we're very happy to have this collaboration. We are really happy to have the opportunity to have this conversation today, and I think and hope that at the end of this seminar, you will agree with me that we have some very, very deep thinking and experienced panelists who will provoke us to think in all kinds of ways. The good news is that we are making progress in reducing maternal, newborn, child, and health mortality. And I always like to start with the good news because I tend to be a glasses half full person, but we know 
that we still have a very long way to go. During the MDG era, global trends in maternal, neonatal, and child mortality decreased, with less relative decrease for neonatal than for maternal and under five, which I think is, is clear here. However, we know that many countries did not meet their MDG 4 and 5 MNCH targets, and we also know that global and national trends blur huge inequities within and across countries, and of course this is true in high, middle, and low resource settings. In the U.S. now we have a huge focus on closing the disparities in care as part of quality efforts. Despite progress, major deficits in quality of care persist. We know that it will be harder to close these quality deficits in the SDG era. We have plucked off many of the lower hanging fruit in the SDG, in the MDG era, and we do face a harder road to go. The Lancet Global Health Commission for High Quality Health Systems, published just under two weeks ago, calculated the excess mortality in low and middle income countries due to poor quality of care versus non-utilization of care and demonstrated that over half of deaths amenable to care as opposed to population health are due to poor quality and we're really fortunate to have Margaret Crook, the lead commissioner with us and I thank you Margaret for your leadership in doing this quantification because it's a huge advocacy tool for this revolution that you're calling for. Countries in global, the global health community are rightly focused on universal health care in the SDG era. However, as uh, quoted here in um, one of the uh, global quality reports that we'll discuss, UHC will remain an empty vessel if quality is not front and center in addition to universal access and protection from financial hardship. Every technical area in global health, and I've worked across many, has its specific quality of care complexities, challenges, and opportunities. For reproductive, maternal, newborn, and child health, quality care must be integrated across the pre-pregnancy, pregnancy, childbirth, postnatal, infancy, and childhood continuum of care. Quality care must reliably deliver integrated packages of evidence-based interventions and services, including immunization services, for every woman and child along each phase of the care continuum and across care platforms and system levels, including for women and newborns and children who develop complications and require more advanced care. And this is no small challenge for all of us. At each phase of this continuum, key domains of quality, which are noted here, which were defined nearly 20 years ago, I would say at the sort of at the launch of the quality movement here in the US, each phase must meet these different dimensions of care that include quality, effectiveness, safety, equity, people-centeredness, and more. However, evidence demonstrates widespread gaps in each of these domains across maternal newborn child health and all healthcare areas, actually. Often, care is not only ineffective, it fails to meet evidence-based guidelines, but it is unsafe. For example, the overuse of obstetric interventions such as uterotonics to speed labor in many settings. And in too many cases, we know that care is not only disrespectful, but actually abusive. And there's lots of evidence on this that many of you are probably familiar with. In, in 1966, Donna Badium published a framework for conceptualizing and measuring quality of healthcare that continues to be very useful for us today and that is reflected in many of the global reports that we'll discuss in a minute. In his framework, it is the combination of inputs and care processes that yield outcomes. Multiple studies have demonstrated that availability of inputs alone, while essential, will not correlate with higher quality care or better health outcomes. And historically, we know that many efforts in global health have focused on key systems inputs for provision of quality care and often have done so in silos. We know governments have to support a system in which care is integrated, but we also know that many of development partners and donors often support individual pieces of these essential inputs. The three, in the last three months, three global health quality reports have been published that all emphasize the importance of focusing on processes, on the interaction of essential system functions and outcomes, health and person-centered in addition to inputs. And all three reports highlight the huge personal and burden 
uh, economic burden of, in, of poor quality and low resource settings and the importance of placing quality at the center of universal health care and the importance of leadership, governance, accountability and systems thinking and system wide action for improving quality. It's not just about quality improvement at the service delivery level. We know that. The People's, uh, in conjunction with the Lancet Commission, a civil society report, and we do have many of the authors and contributors in this room, uh, was published. And I encourage you all to look at this. And, excuse me, I'm sorry. Um, we see here a quote from a woman uh, from one of, uh, from a low and middle income country, and we might hear this also in a high resource setting. And basically, we cannot know what was hard for her if we do not listen to her, we have to listen to people and we have to engage community and civil society as part of our ongoing efforts to design and improve care. The WHO multi-country network for improving MNCH was launched in Malawi in nine first phase countries last, uh, I think it was February of 2017. We were saying yesterday it's still really a baby. And we are, are very honored to have Blair Tamaliki, who leads this effort on the part of WHO. And you will hear more about this work in panel two. I would like to just say that a great strength of this framework and the approach of the network is that it prioritizes provision of competent care and experience of care and activated health system functions. And it's really been an honor for MCSP to be able to work with the network. Um, one of the key messages from all three global reports from the, uh, one of the organizing principles of the network as well as our own experience and I think many countries experience is that we must work across system levels at national, subnational, and service delivery level and that we must lever existing systems. Um, and that context really matters. A brief word about measurement and then I'm almost done with my opening comments. Um, Many efforts are underway to identify meaningful quality of care measures that can be used by different actors across different system levels. And we know there is not a one size fits all. And I would argue that in RMNCH, we've been a little bit perhaps behind where we would like to be with respect to identifying these quality of care measures. The WHO Quality of Care Network promotes a set of common quality measures for monitoring across all learning sites. And over half of these measures are focused on quality of care and outcomes. And MCSP, it's really been an honor to co-chair with WHO and UNICEF this monitoring working group. MCSP works at global and country level in 30 plus countries. And we feel very fortunate to have to be able to engage at these multiple levels to bring the global resources and learning to the country and to bring the country realities and learning at all levels of the system, including that midwife in a peripheral health center and the district manager. I'd like to end by saying that we know it takes a global and a local village if we want to provoke and support a true revolution for quality. And you will hear from a variety of perspectives, including government, WHO, development partners, and academia in the next two panels. Thank you. Thank you, Kathleen. This morning I have the privilege of moderating this wonderful panel. And implementing quality improvement requires an interesting balance between having very clear aspirational goals and being rooted in local realities, local context, and local systems. And as Theodore Roosevelt said, you have to keep your eyes on the stars and you have to keep your feet on the ground. And you have to do it at the same time. So our first panel today is really going to help us explore what does it take, what does it mean to really, in the country level, to improve quality of care. And I'm happy to have uh, my four inspiring panelists who will share examples from three countries, Uganda, Nigeria, and Madagascar. And my four panelists are Dr. Jessica Sabiti, who's the Commissioner of Maternal and Child Health with the Ministry of Health in Uganda. Dr. Tubugu uh, Okoli, or Ugo, as we like to call her, um, who's the Deputy Chief of Party of USAID's Maternal and Child Survival Program in Nigeria, and Japaigo's Deputy Country Director. Then we have Dr. Boniface Onwe, 
who is the director of the public health department for the Ebony State Ministry of Health and the Ebony State program manager for the Saving One Million Lives program for results. And finally, we have Eliane Razafin. <laughs> <laughs> I love your surname so much. <laughs> <laughs> Raza Fermandimbi, um, who's the chief of party for the Maternal and Child Survival Program in Madagascar. As a side note, for those of you in our audience, you will have full bios of all of our panelists and speakers. And for those of you online, tomorrow the bios and all of the presentations will be available. So a very warm welcome to our panelists. You've all come from very far distances to be with us. Um, and today our panel is going to follow, the, follow this, the following format. We will do very short country presentations. I will ask some additional reflective questions based on the presentations. And finally, we'll open it up for you to ask our panelists questions because I'm sure you will have many. So without further delay, we'd like to ask Dr. Jessica Sibiti to take the podium um, and to share her experience from Uganda. Um, this presentation is really going to take a systems view on what does it take to strengthen government systems, processes, and tools and structures to make sure that a country is investing for a commitment to quality in the long term. Thank you, Dr. Zibiti. Uh, thank you very much, and uh, thank you for having us here uh, for this important meeting. Um, I will, uh, I'll begin by taking you through uh, a bit of the history of the trends on the mortality figures in Uganda. And as you can see, to begin with, um, the current trajectory in Uganda shows that Uganda will not be able to meet the targets for the SDGs and also the national target targets on mortality, since mortality has not improved over several decades. Uh, we are also aware that Uganda has one of the highest birth rates in the world. And that means Uganda will definitely lose more children and mothers in absolute numbers between now and then, due not only to inadequate implementation of the many maternal child health interventions, as you can see from the scorecard, but also due to poor uptake of these life-saving interventions. This is partly due to the distance and the cost issues, but also because of the early experiences and disrespective treatment and lack of trust patients have in the healthcare system. In fact, there's been a, a, a big acknowledgement in the country that over the years, quality of care has become a lesser priority. There are people who think that in the 1990s, we actually focused more on quality of care than now. And that has been a key driver for the Uganda processes. I would now like to take you through some of the policy uh, enabling issues we've been tackling to be able to set a, a conducive climate for moving into focusing on quality of care. So working closely with our partners and other actors in the country, in 2013, the government embarked on a process of institutionalizing uh, a quality assurance and improvement system, which was guided by uh, a development of five-year health sector quality improvement framework and plan. And uh, in addition to this overall act of action plan, we were able to develop a new RMNCH Sharpen plan, which was later updated in 2016. And uh, this plan prioritizes key areas for investment. And since then, we've been able to mobilize resources, not only to implement the whole plan, but also to focus on quality improvement. Uh, we've received a grant from the IDA and the GFF to support some of these interventions. Thinking about the additional lives we can save in terms of providing effective, safe, and respective care, Uganda has also gone ahead to adopt the new WHO standards and uh, network initiative. Uganda is one of the first nine pathfinder countries, and we've been able to domesticate these standards. We've developed a roadmap for implementation, and we've also begun doing the initial capacity building activities. In fact, we are now implementing in 29 districts, and five of them have already gone through the whole cycle of inception, facility readiness assessment, uh, capacity building, coaching exercises, and also sharing the results. Unfortunately, I will not be able to share the results here, but in the future meetings, we'll be able to share some of the results. On creating policy environment further, we've also been able to define 
uh, a governance structure and different packages for service delivery for the healthcare system, focusing on the continuum of care along the life cycle, but also making sure that we define service packages for the different levels of care, right from the bottom to the top, what can be delivered and what type of standards are actually expected. And this has not only provoked uh, alignment of interventions, but also it does emphasize the system-wide approach we're trying to promote in the country. Uh, this slide shows the Sharpen plan and the strategic shifts in the Sharpen plan on the left side side. And then the, on the right side, we show how we have been able to do the bottleneck analysis within this plan on the key quality of care gaps we want to deal with and the areas of focus. Being able to calculate and agree on the numbers of lives saved over the next five years using this plan has been able to amplify joint efforts and voices from different people around common goals, around common survival priorities, and also around common bottlenecks to tackle, including quality of care. The next slide shows our theory of change, uh, which clearly communicates the message that efforts towards optimizing universal health care coverage should not only strengthen access, but crucially should ensure that services that women, adolescents, and newborn and children receive are actually effective, they are safe, and respectful, and they also address their needs which they deserve. The next slide I'm going to share with you here is about learning. Sp I want to make specific mention of learning because this is one of the newest uh, element of our approach. And the approach here has been uh, implemented through maximizing uh, available interventions, but we have been able to identify a few tracer interventions for the beginning to use to track the issues and how we learn this process. We are also trying to expand on the platforms for sharing information. We've then introduced an annual RMNCH assembly and a quality improvement conference for every financial year. And we are also trying to maximize the use of technology to be able to share data, real-time data on dashboards. I would like to end uh, close by sharing some of the achievements and maybe some of the lessons we have learned through this process. This growing public health experience uh, on, on, on quality and ambitious targets set by government to save more lives has actually raised the bar for the government systems to produce better health outcomes and greater social value from our services. And in response, the government has established a service delivery unit at the highest level called uh, popular known as Hakuna Mbuchezo. This literally means that there, there are no more games from now. It's a Swahili word. <laughs> and uh, this service delivery unit is actually housed in the prime minister's office. And this has actually made, uh, put pressure on sectors and, and government agencies to be able to focus on quality of care. We have, also, we have generally learned that poor quality infrastructure and healthcare practice can actually be improved through a nationally recognized quality of care standards, certification system, and accreditation measures can actually be set up, and you can begin a journey in this direction. We have also, we now know that, and I've started seeing that, technical competencies and motivation of health workers, despite poor staffing, can actually be improved, and it's able to determine and improve individual performance activities using these mechanisms. However, we have also learned that the most effective approach approaches are those that involve active participation of these health workers, including education outreaches that, that entails the use of a trained personnel coming from outside and working with the people at the facility level to ensure that they meet their healthcare professional requirements. And we have actually decided to incorporate in our assessment tools a component for providing technical assistance when we go to do assess. We have continued to, lastly, I would like to mention that uh, we are continuing to learn, and learning is going to be a major component, especially at the management level. We don't only learn from what we say, but we learn from the data, and later has become a key driver for the process. And we are also hoping that in the next phase, we strengthen the community component and monitoring of services using welfare groups and community health workers in the process. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jessica. 
So moving from the national focus, we're going to take a slightly different lens now, and we're going to focus on a country example from the state perspective. And we're going to ask Dr. Onwe and Dr. Okoli to come up and take the podium um, and share a really interesting example from Nigeria. Nigeria is a country that has prioritized maternal and newborn health and is also one of the first wave countries participating in WHO's Quality, Equity, Dig Dignity Network. And we're very happy that we have a dynamic duo this morning to share an interesting e example from a state Ministry of Health perspective and also from a project perspective. Thank you. Thank you, Chanta. Greetings from the people of Nigeria. Our presentation is focusing on improving quality of maternal and newborn care in Ebony and Kogi states of Nigeria. As you can see from the chart on display, Nigeria was not able to meet the MDG goals four and five, and still contributes to 14% of the global burden of maternal mortality and 10% of the global burden of newborn deaths, which is terrible. Then on the SDGs, the country is only on track for SDG 13, which is dealing with climate change. Nigeria conducts national demographic and health survey, which happens every four to five years. And in the last one conducted in 2013, there was a curious discovery. We discovered that uh, the area, the locations, regions of Nigeria that have high population of ski bed attendants did not have the expected reduction in perinatal mortality compared to the ones that have low ski bed attendants. The implication of this is that even the quality of care our ski bed attendants are delivering is suboptimal. As, as such, MCSP decided to uh, support the government of Nigeria to implement interventions aimed at improving the quality of care around the day of birth and especially in the neonatal period. Our goal is actually to ensure provision of right care for every woman, newborn, and child at the right time, every time. But Nigeria is a very big country. So to achieve this is not easy. There have to be involved engagement of the stakeholders at different levels. And this is what MCSP helped us to do. Starting at the national level, there were multi-level stakeholders uh, engagement. And these stakeholders uh, decided to look at the WHO quality of care framework for maternal and newborn health which was eventually adopted by the country and approved as the guide for the implementation of quality of care in Nigeria. And because this will be implemented in two states, the governments of the two states, the Bonyan Kogi states, were involved at all levels of the development of the national quality of care strategy. These are the two states that benefited from the program, Ebony State and Kogi States. Now, to give us a guide on what to do, in 2016, there was an initial baseline assessment that was conducted actually in two phases. The first phase was a facility readiness assessment, and then followed by a more robust quality of care baseline assessment. The aim was to identify critical gaps that needs to be filled to improve the quality of care. The following gaps were identified. S limited skills, mainly in proper monitoring of labor using pathograph, newborn resuscitation skills, active management of third stage of labor, infection prevention and control uh, practices, and we also discovered that, yeah, we are not there with regards to respectful maternity care. Also, cutting across most of the facilities is limited availability of essential reproductive maternal and newborn health commodities. Having done that, 321 facilities were selected and supported for quality of care active for the implementation of maternal and child survival program in the first place. I will come to that later. 
Now, at the state level, a lot of things have to be done because just as we involved, there were multi-layer stakeholders involvement at the national level. There was also multi-layer stakeholders involvement at the state level. So each of the states also, uh, following the direction of the national, adopted the WHO quality of care framework on maternal, newborn, and child health. And both states are selected as demonstration states for quality of care in Nigeria. What we also did is that with the support of MCSP, out of the 321 facilities being supported, we selected a subset of 91 facilities, 45 in Ibony State, and then 46 in Kogi State, for in-depth implementation of quality of care interventions centered on date of birth services. To achieve this, we have to have a coordinating mechanism beginning with uh, constituting a quality of care committee at the state level. And in each of those facilities we, are, we selected, we had to form quality improvement teams with very clear responsibilities. Each has their work plan. And then we also agreed on the indicators and the targets we aim to achieve at the different levels. We have similar indicators, but our targets at the primary healthcare, secondary, and tertiary are different. Next was to bridge other gaps identified. So healthcare workers' capacity was built on both clinical and QI skills with additional on-site supportive supervision. And we had periodic peer reviews to reflect on what is going on. We have a quality care, dash uh, care dashboard so that the indicators being tracked are on the dashboard. And my colleague, Dr. Gokoli, will take the presentation from here to show us the results so far. Thank you very much. Okay, um, thank you, Dr. Ongwe. So the next couple of slides uh, will focus on the results of the QI work that Dr. Ongwe has just described in the two states in Nigeria. The health facilities and the state actually selected the indicators uh, to measure progress. And these indicators were based on the findings and the gaps identified in the baseline, as Dr. Ongwe has described. Uh, for this particular chart you're looking at, it's focused on the maternal health indicators and we chose three of them, the active management of stage, stage of labor using youth neurotonics, and you can see that in the dark blue line, the use of pathograph for monitoring labor, which is the lighter blue line below, and of course measuring BP and uh, fetal heart rate on the day of birth, which is the red and uh, yellow respectively. As you can see from the slide, there is a significant improvement made over time from 2016 when we started to June 2018. <laughs> Uh, these improvements are for all the facilities. Of course, each facility, actually all the facilities improved at different rates. On the side of the chart, on the left side, you will also see illustrative changes, which is like uh, the, the processes that underpin these improvements that we've seen. And I'll just mention one, which is um, people-centered care. Uh, by reorganizing care pathways, uh, we actually benefited the patient, especially in terms of time that they spent um, in the facilities when they visited. Uh, the next chart is focusing on the newborn uh, health care. We focused on the essential newborn uh, uh, indicators, and one of them was the care uh, pro uh, application of um, chlorhexidine uh, to cut care to prevent newborn infections in the dark blue line. And another one was the initiation of breastfeeding um, within 30 minutes of birth. Um, in the red line. As, uh, as you can see again, we've made significant improvement and also actually tried maintained that improvement in the last one year. On the side, you would also see illustrative changes. One of them includes, um, uh, you know, setting up newborn corners in the labor wards that had all the equipment and commodities. So for instance, we had like the bag and mask uh, readily available when we find that a newborn is asphyxiated and needed uh, resuscitation. We didn't stop at that, we also looked at outcomes as well. So uh, if you look at the chart on the right side, which is the gray line, it's looking at the number of newborns who were asphyxiated, or percentage of newborns asphyxiated that were actually successfully uh, resuscitated. 
An important measure was the uh, obstetric case fatality rate. We actually adapted from the QED network in terms of their measurements and chose to actually look at this case fatality rate, uh, which is made up of uh, obstetric complications and deaths from those complications. And as you can see from the line when we started, the red arrow, that we are having a decreasing trend at the moment. So um, I would actually like to share some of a uh, couple of reflections and recommendations uh, for those that are emb embarking on this sort of um, activity. We know that partnership and leadership at all levels is essential. You know, you have to show leadership at the state, the local government, and the health facility to actually make it different. We also know that y if you build the skills of healthcare workers, that is just not enough. You have to also get them to practice, support them on site to ensure that they're actually practicing and you're correcting and they're actually seeing the support being given by the state. We know that the pre-service education is essential as well. And for pre-service education, there are two things. One is actually building the capacities of the tutors to ensure that they are producing healthcare workers that are thinking of quality uh, from the start, and also equipping pre-service institutions as learning centers. Documentation of data, uh, uh, documentation is actually very n uh, not very well used at the facility level. So two things, documenting care, very important, also documenting data for decision making also important. And of course, lastly, the shared learning, uh, which we have talked about, it strengthens critical thinking, um, ensures that we take uh, best practices, and ensure that we also correct what we are doing as we go along. So I would like to end by thanking all the partners that have actually been involved in this work, from the state to professional associations. And I would like to say thank you also for listening to us this morning. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Anwe and Dr. Kole. Eliane. So the final example of our um, country series this morning is going to focus on Madagascar. What does quality improvement look like in a country that's at the beginning of their quality journey without a national strategy and formal structures? So Eliane will share an example of work done in Madagascar at significant scale, covering two-thirds of the country and more than 800 facilities. Thank you, Eliane. Thank you, Chantal. Good morning, everyone. It's really a pleasure for me to be here today to share the experience of Madagascar. Like many African countries, Madagascar did not achieve the MDGs for maternal and newborn health. In fact, over the past 20 years, although Madagascar made progress for reducing under five and infant mortality, over the same period, neonatal and uh, maternal mortality have stagnated, as you can see as a red line on, on this uh, graph. In response, in 2014, the government of Madagascar developed a roadmap for accelerating the achievement of the MDG related to maternal and newborn, uh, newborn health. And the goal is to halve both maternal and newborn mortality by 2019. As you can see, the goals in, in dot line here. The USAID Maternal and Child Survival Program was given the mandate to support the Ministry of Health to achieve these ambitious targets. And in 2014, we started implementation with a detailed facility assessment to identify the challenge, to highlight priority for intervention, and the result showed significant gaps in the facility readiness to provide uh, quality uh, maternal and newborn health services. Uh, some key gaps include uh, few provider trains in BMONC, issue of commodities, poor infection, uh, poor infection prevention and control, and poor infrastructure. So the overall goal of the uh, program was to support implementation of key aspects of that roadmap in USAID priority region with a focus on improving quality of maternal and newborn care. This was a, an ambitious project, I have to say, with a large like, geographic scope. Mm -hmm. uh, we had to implement in phase over three years. We uh, were able to achieve uh, coverage of the 16 region uh, covered by USAID. And with that, we covered nearly two thirds of the country, 800 facilities, and about 1,500 providers trained to offer service to a population of 17 million habitants. Coverage at scale of high impact intervention through skilled provider was a major priority of the roadmap. However, in order to implement, uh, to have impact and to have really quality of care, we needed to engage with the health system at different level. 
at national level needed to update the key strategic document like the norms and protocol, the guidelines, to reflect the global guidelines. At district and regional level, we engaged and built the capacity of dist district teams to undertake trainings and supervision to monitor the facility performance and really truly uh, lead the effort with the objectives that they can sustain those efforts in the future. And of course, at facility level, the providers needed the training, um, the supervision and equipment, and they were also supported in monitoring a standard data dashboard for tracking key quality indicators. In selected facility, MCSP supported implementation of a, a QI, clinical governance, uh, governance team, and also engaged with the community to improve the quality of care in the facilities. The results I will share in the next slide uh, are aggregated data from the uh, MNH facility dashboard I was mentioning. Over three and a half years, uh, a common set of uh, eight quality of care indicators were tracked monthly for about 600 facilities. One key process indicators were relate was related to uh, screening of preeclampsia, eclampsia. Indeed, early detection of this condition via systematic blood pressure screening is um, uh, critical for reducing mortality. And this slide demonstrates increasing rate of blood pressure screening during antenatal visit from a baseline of 40% uh, to above 90% of antenatal care visit within just a year, and we are able to sustain this at this level until the end of the program. Facility introduced uh, changes in client flow to ensure systematic blood pressure measurement during antenatal visit. Another example of uh, uh, change introduced by facility is negotiating with pharmacy so that in the delivery room we have an emergency kit with oxytocin and magnesia sulfate uh, uh, to just in case. Another process indicator that we monitored was around postpartum <laughs> family planning that MCSP introduced at scale. Providers were trained in counseling, but also in the provision of services, including implants and IOD postpartum. Rega organizing the services and training providers facilitated the counseling both in antenatal, uh, antenatal care, in early labor, and also after delivery, resulting in really increased number of women uh, taking up family planning, uh, taking a family planning method after delivery. Before, provider just refer the woman for family planning to another department or to another facility with the risk that actually they come back uh, after a few months to just deliver another baby. The dashboard not only uh, allowed us to monitor process indicators, but also some key outcomes. As you can see from this slide, a significant reduction were achieved in both maternal mortality and fresh stillbirth uh, at the primary facility level for nearly 100,000 deliveries. These improved outcomes were not only seen at the facility level, at the primary facility level, but also at district and regional hospital. For the approximately um, uh, 60 hospital MCSP supported, similar improvement were achieved as monitored through the data dash dashboard. And this slide show a reduction in maternal, uh, in newborn mortality rate in the five regional hospital where MCSP supported an introduction and the monitoring of a, a QI team. Uh, those QI team or clinical governance teams uh, uh, developed action plans to improve quality of care. And one example of change that was really tremendous was ensuring that newborn station kit was available in the operating room. So after a C-section, the midwife did not have to carry the baby to the neonatal unit, often which was located in another building, saving lives. To conclude, uh, I would like to say that even in a weak system without quality improvement structure, it is possible to support district manager and facility provider to measure and improve quality of care at a relative scale. Uh, in addition, we demonstrated that introduction of QI team, a clinical governance team, helps strengthen the overall management and also the organization of health care services so that we can promote an enabling environment for quality of care. Um, but of course, it is essential that the we have leadership and commitment of manager and health workers at across all the systems level. And uh, in fact, despite the progress we had at the district and facility level, things have not moved very fast at the national level. And more advocacy is needed uh, because to be able to sustain and continue improvement work, national level leadership is really essential. And the de development of a national quality strategy and structure remains a high priority for Madagascar. To end my presentation, 
uh, I would like to really acknowledge, acknowledge that uh, this result I just shared was really represent the hard work of the trained providers, the district and regional MOH team that we supported, the MCSP team supported, and of course, you funding from USAID. Thank you for your attention. Thank you to our panelists. Um, th these three country examples are really rich and it feels like seven minutes is just not enough to get into the details. <laughs> so I, I've been thinking as I've been listening to them talking, I've got a question for each one of them just to dig into a little aspect before we open uh, up to you as the audience. So they really like to start at the national level. Dr. Jessica, you, your example was very rich because it showed a very thoughtful, articulated approach to setting systems and processes in place from a government point of view. And I'm sure as you were preparing this presentation, it also took a lot of reflection from yourself and like, where are we? What are we learning? What's going well? What are my challenges? So I don't know if you could really start off by just giving us some of those reflections uh, of where you are in the process and where you see Uganda moving forward. Thank you very much. Um, th this morning, uh, my presentation was mostly meant to reflect our journey so far. You're all aware that, uh, as I said, court of care is not a new thing. We've been doing court of care for several years. Uganda is one of the countries which actually benefited from uh, the Saving Mothers Giving Lives. And we've just finished our celebration with the Big Harvest Meeting. And we're able to reduce mortality within one year of 30%, which actually for us was a very important, not only a proof of concept, but it, insp it inspired us. At this point of stage, uh, at this point of time, my presentation is reflecting on some of those experiences. And one of the greatest things we learn is that um, whereas it's possible to change quality of care, the greatest possibility of success comes from, of course, a multifaceted interventions. Uh, building on health system, but it's very important to have a progressive policy environment. What is happening in some of the SMGO districts since the project ended, mortality has gone up. And we're now battling with these districts and telling them we had proper entry processes, mm. we came to the leadership, we planned with you, we converged all the efforts together, we did a system-wise approach, and we thought that had solved it. This time round, we want to see more ownership and leadership in this process. And uh, when we talk about leadership, we want to learn from the data, the information we have. And we don't want only to teach technical managers. Mm. We want other managers. And when I talk about managers, I'm talking about politicians. Because right now, they're the ones writing the complaints. We are losing so many mothers from C-sections from this hospital because they were not used to the deaths that had gone down dramatically. I'm talking about training managers, managers learning from the, but also using the data. So in our new process now, because now we are moving into another process and using other entry points to improve quality, like performance-based financing, we are expecting districts first of all to apply. Mm. They must show interest and make commitments. We're also expecting, we're going to, we're assessing the facilities and the facility must qualify we have set some thresholds. And if they don't qualify, the district can talk to partners, can talk to USID, can mobilize their own resources to make sure that these facilities actually enter the game. So we, we are kind of reflecting a bit and, and trying to make sure that creating a progressive policy environment is more important than running for the results. Mm. Because if you converge all these resources together, mm. if you bring everybody, you should be able to get results. The question is, what happens when the resources go? Mm. That is one. Mm. The other thing also we are trying to do is to make sure that we have participation. We want to converge efforts from the academia, from the community. We are working on a very small, small initiative with the MCSP actually team here to expand the reaching every community, the red strategy, to expand it to address uh, our MNCH. And one of the things we are looking at, first of all, to get the denominators right. Yeah. We're doing new catchment mappings. We are registering the households. We want to know where our target populations are in each community. How many adolescents? Mm. How many pregnant mothers should we expect? Even when you give incentives and results, 
the health facility must know. Mm -hmm. I'm expecting 20 mothers, but I'm seeing five mothers. And then tag this into the planning process and do a bottom-up approach. Mm -hmm. So our new emphasis is to push for participation, as I said, mm -hmm. and make sure that we lay a foundation for policy using a system-wide approach so that even when the funds dwindle, mm -hmm. we have a World Bank loan now. Once this World Bank comes to an end, we have a system which can mm -hmm. uh, progressively push these things forward. So that is our interest. Thank you so much for those very thoughtful observations that are relevant, I'm sure, to many other countries that are starting to approach similar places. I want to turn the, my question now to um, Dr. Anwe. So moving from the national, that very strong, thoughtful national point of view, I was really struck in your presentation about the critical role that that sub-national level plays because it, you link national policy to implementation, but you also are able to feed back actual implementation experience into the national level and into policy and your work that you've done at really with implementing in Nigeria, but also in participating in the Quality, Equity, Dignity Network as one of the nine countries. So if you had to give a recommendation to another manager, maybe from a different country, who was really working at that linking level, at that subnational level, do you have any high level recommendations that you could provide? Thank you very much, Anton. Yes, there are. What I consider <laughs> most useful in the first place, is to have a harmonized strategic direction, uh, especially if the state is lucky to be supported by multiple partners interested in quality of care. The partners have to first of all come together with the relevant authorities, agree on what they want to do, and then it will be best to have a policy document that clearly spells out what and what they want to do. All relevant stakeholders have to be involved at all uh, periods, at all stages of the implementation. And then, very important, if indicators are to be tracked, which usually will be tracked, there has to be a consensus on reasonable, measurable indicators that can be tracked. And I will advise that at the start, don't track every indicator, because it will be difficult. These things take a lot of energy. Another thing is that um, if you are starting, it is good to know where you are. And because of that, I will strongly recommend that there is a baseline first, and that baseline will help to identify existing gaps. And then if those gaps are identified, then interventions can be designed to bridge those gaps and that will be very, very helpful. From our own experience, what we have also uh, discovered is that it may not be possible to roll out QI activities across all facilities at the same time. So I will recommend phased implementation, which means uh, start with a small number of facilities, then stabilize those facilities, and then move on to scale up to another facilities. That's why in a Boeing state, we are MCSP is supporting 119 facilities. We have uh, we are tracking QI um, indices in 45, and we are hoping to scale up gradually until we reach every facility. Another thing is that quality of care demands change of attitude of the health workers because. Doing things better means doing things differently because if you do the same thing all over and over and expecting the same result, I don't think it works. <laughs> so now to make people change how they do things takes time because people like to do things the way they are used to doing it. So because of that, uh, achieving the results will not be very immediate. And you don't expect the health workers to clap for you when you come with <laughs> all your checklists and uh, everything. <laughs> don't expect them to clap for you. So you have to really, really, really uh, give some time. And very important, it's not about bringing them to big hotels only. Yeah, you will bring them to big hotels and teach them. But you have to leave your, the comfort of your office and go to the facilities to really find out how far what you have thought is being practiced. Mm. And then lastly, it will be very, very important to begin from the first, the early period to think of, okay, 
Yes, we want to start implementing quality improvement. How do we fund it? Especially when funders are leading the process, when there are uh, implementing partners leading the process. It's good to start from the beginning to say, okay, if we do this pilot, how do we go from there? And then for countries like, like Africans, like African countries, I would strongly recommend that from the time the idea is conceived, we start strategize to have a budget line that will drive implementation of QI activities. I think my time is up. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Andre. I think maybe you should write some, you know, handover notes <laughs> for state ministers. I think that would be very helpful. So I'm going to move now to um, Dr. Okoli and to think one of the things that Kathleen mentioned in her opening notes was talking about the client experience of care. And it's come up in a number of the presentations. And so what we're going to do is I, I would love you to just reflect on what does it really take? in low resource settings and a country like Nigeria to really put the client front and center in our work. And if you're making some recommendations to another project or another country to work in this area, what are some of your high level, and I'm gonna ask you to, to be quite brief, yeah. some of your high level recommendations? Okay, um, Chantel, thank you very much. This is quite uh, an important area that is often neglected, you know, people-centered care, respectful maternity care. So one of my recommendations will be to ensure that wherever you're doing this, that first of all, you find out what are the drivers of that um, disrespectful care and what actually facilitates respectful maternity care and find out from the stakeholders so these stakeholders are the women that use the services, the um, healthcare workers themselves, and other key stakeholders around um, that environment that we are talking about. Then the next step that I would recommend is that you actually sit everybody down together and actually begin to synthesize from them, because it will come from them, what are those interventions that would actually mitigate this um, disrespectful care that we all see all over the place. And you know, there are ex activities that we know that have gone on, such as ensuring that we are giving the right communication you know, to the women at the right time, and also you know, ensuring that they are coming with their companions uh, during delivery or or even ANC, but also for the uh, healthcare workers as well, because they also get disrespected mm -hmm. by mm -hmm. some uh, from by some clients. So you have to also look at packages of caring for carers as well. And I want to just mention here that MCSP, funded by you said, globally recently actually did a lot of RMC assessment. First of all, in Nigeria and other countries, and we are actually in that process of meeting with the stakeholders and getting the, the interventions, further interventions that we have to mitigate this problem. In fact, yesterday in Airbonne, we had this um, stakeholders meeting on RMC to actually see how we move forward. Mm. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, and my last question, you know, from Madagascar for Elian, in, a, in an example where we have the quality journey is, is pretty new, one of the interesting things that came up in your presentation was this very strong commitment to measurement. Um, you spoke about having a core set of eight indicators, of dashboards, and that sounds very easy to do, but in reality it isn't. And so we'd love to hear some of your thoughts about how you did that. How was it possible? Um, and how did you use that to drive further improvement and motivation? And you know, out of that, do you have any recommendations for other countries? Thank you, Chantal. I will start by how we did it. I mean, uh, we have to understand that providers are not used to measure quality of care indicators. And it was, so it was important from the beginning that we select a, a common set of indicators to track. Then uh, when we, uh, we pilot this dashboard in 15 facilities, we're able to really, within uh, a few years, just uh, uh, spread, uh, scale up to uh, the other intervention region by integrating the, the, the training on the use of the dashboard, uh, integrating this into the uh, training, or MNH training of the providers. So we are able, I mean, the providers were just allowed, uh, were able to uh, just uh, understand and link their performances 
with the with the, the dashboard, so they can really see it, they can really see it. But to be able to sustain quality improvement in the facility, we had to train everybody, not just the midwife, not just the head of the facility. So we had to train everybody, and this was done by the third year as we started on-site trainings and on-site supervision. We also had to work closely with the district team and the regional team, making sure that they really conduct this supervision and monitor the facility dashboard. So every supervision visit, every mentoring call was structured around the QI dashboard. So they really were working closely with uh, uh, working on that. So as a recommendation, I would say that it is really important to work with the Ministry of Health to define what are the indicators that really uh, define the, the quality of what is impact uh, quality of care. And we have to keep in mind that a dashboard at the facility level uh, will track different indicators for the providers and for the district. But at the national level, national stakeholders need other indicators. So we have to keep that in mind because there are always expectations that we have to keep, uh, we have to uh, manage. Uh, one important thing is, I think, from our experience, that it is important also for sustainability to really uh, integrate this within the HMI system. Uh, right now, Madagascar is really uh, uh, transitioning into the DHS2, so we're doing a lot of advocacy right now uh, through the technical working group to make sure that MOH and stakeholders uh, integrate QI indicators and dashboard into the new system. Mm. Thank you, Elian. So I'm sure now you have lots of questions and we have a couple of moments. I, I know I could just keep asking them questions, um, but I've been told to share. So I we are going to have someone who's going to uh, be passing a mic around. And we'd like to ask you four things today. And I'm sure you'll be able to um, do this very easily. One, please, can you ask a question? If you have something to share, please share with us afterwards. Please, could you make that question very short so we can have as many questions as possible? Um, please tell us who you are. We'd love to know. And finally, if you would like to address your question to a particular panelist, let us know. Otherwise, I'm happy to do that for you. So um, can we pass the microphone? Well, thank you very much. And uh, <clears throat> my name is Dr. Amanullah. I'm from Pakistan. I'm representing Vitable Alliance. I'm the chairman of the board in Pakistan. So first of all, my congratulations and compliments to the entire panel and the, some of the exciting work which has been shared with us. I was just wondering, I mean, a lot of emphasis has been placed on the, on the, on the supply side when we talk about the quality of care. I heard from Dr. Okoli some of the interventions which were done on the demand side were the, by engaging communities in terms of assessing the, 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 the level of respectful maternity care. But if you could share, like, for example, be, uh, some, 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 some sort of like the change or impact which we have made by focusing more on the, on the demand side, where quality of care has been promoted as a right of every woman, every child in that community, and how has that impacted quality of care or the results which you have achieved? So an emphasis on that aspect would be really important to, to hear from you. Thank you, Dr. Amanullah. Let's take two more questions, and then we can direct it to the panel. Thank you. Uh, I'm Indira Narayanan. I'm an independent consultant and adjunct professor in the Georgetown University. I'd like to congratulate all the speakers. It was a really wonderful panel. I'd like to ask uh, that it's so good that we are trying to improve quality and you have shown very good results. What is being set in place as processes, interventions, and indicators to make sure that it is sustainable? In other words, how do we make sure that the stars stay aligned? And the second thing is, as our mortality is dropping, don't you think that we also need now to look into the quality of the survival? not just the deaths, but also to see how these children, uh, primarily I think it depends more, uh, I mean it affects the children more, how are they developing and how are they growing. Excellent, thank you. And we've got another question as well from the overflow room, which is really related to quality, um, uh, quality improvement indicators. Um, you know, should our quality improvement indicators change as we make progress and how would you deal with that? So integrating quality improvement indicators into DHIS2 is good, but how do we let them progress over time? So we've got three good questions to start. Um, 
And none of our panelists, none of our um, audience directed the questions. So I'm going to (laughs) um, direct the questions. So I think maybe in terms of um, measurement, um, if we could start with the DHIS question too. Dr. Onwe and Eliane, maybe you could reflect a little bit about um, quality of care indicators. And could you reflect a little bit about how you would see them possibly changing over time and how they could, you know, should be linked? You know, you talked to Eliane about different managers needing different things at different levels. And Dr. Onwe, maybe, you know, thinking about this from a state point of view, if you could just reflect on what's useful for you and how you would like those indicators to progress. You talked about choosing a few indicators at the beginning. Could you just give us your very brief thoughts? Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, Yes. Uh, When um, it comes to indicators, because um, these indicators are tracked at the facility level, but you need to coordinate what is happening at the facilities at the state level, especially if it's a big country like Nigeria. And then uh, we don't want things to end at the state level. We want to also give feedback uh, to the national. Now, if it is very, very important how you select the indicators, because if the indicators are things that are already captured in the national um, health information management system data tools, it will be easier. If there is already on DHIS, then it is easier for you to try. Otherwise, you may have some indicators that will entail going through individual case notes to lift, know what was done. And that would be, is usually very, very cumbersome. Mm-hmm. And um, when you have that, it, it, will, it will be difficult to scale up. So, it's best, but at times it is not practicable mm-hmm. because some of the things that we're interested in in quality of care are not yet uh, captured in the uh, national health management information uh, tools. Thank you. Eliane, anything to add? I, I agree. I, I just want thoughts? to add, I think, an uh, example we did uh, uh, with, uh, with the regional hospital that we have QA teams. So actually, uh, um, what we did is that uh, they, they didn't, we did not uh, uh, develop a common set of indicators for them. They were actually uh, free to choose the indicators that matters for them. So they had to, uh, based on the, the, the what really the problem they had, the gaps they identified in the facility, they de- identified the indicators and they followed them. And we have to be uh, in the faci- at the facility level. I think it's possible because that means that when they have achieved uh, a really progress on one indicator, they can just change, leave it and change to another indicator because they saw that it's this indicator is a problem. So Mm. I think uh, we have to leave the room for the facility to change. But we have to agree that, yes, at national level, we we need to have to be able to do on scale. We need a really common set of indicators that we need to monitor at a really larger scale. Thank you, Eliane. Yeah. So, Dr. Okoli, would you mind reflecting a little bit about, you know, engaging the community, your high-level thoughts on, um, you know, how do, we, how do we strike this balance about improving the quality of services and engaging um, communities to use them? Yeah. Um, uh, like the, the, um, the gentleman actually rightly said, it's not just about the supply side. It's also about the demand and how do you create that. And when they actually come to the facility that they have the right environment. That they are. So I'll just share a couple of things that we've done. So when we talk about these QI teams, particularly at the PHC level, they have membership um, of the QI team. And the memberships actually are part of the, the communities are part of that, that QI team. So you can have a, a ward development committee chairman or secretary from the community representing the community. You can have a women, woman leader. Uh, you can have a youth leader, a religious leader, part of the community actually sharing that aspect, representing the women from the community within the facility and in terms of the changes. I must say part of this RMC assessment that I just talked about done by the Global MCSP project um, included the patient satisfaction survey as well. And we're just analyzing the results of that. And one of the things that we have seen uh, the patients have shared compared to the baseline that we did is that they are beginning to see that we have, they have a bit of privacy when they actually go to facility. There are some labor wards that are so small you know, that you sort of wonder how, you know, how (laughs) a bed getting inside there in the first place and then bringing your own uh, um, family also inside there. 
people are being allowed companions is quite common here but down in our place it's not very easy to allow your husband or your family to actually come into the labor ward so that is being allowed at the moment and then um, I would just like to say that um, there are still challenges uh, we still have issues around uh, preference you know when people come for ANC for instance they might just pick somebody that they know to actually um, go before somebody that has been waiting there and women are, complain about that a lot and then there are also issues around detention you know when somebody are, is not able to pay um, at the end of um, giving birth to a baby in a hospital unfortunately some hospitals still detain um, uh, those women and those are the sort of things that we want to change in terms of respectful maternity care. Thank you. And finally, Dr. Sabiti, just some very brief reflections on thinking beyond the day of birth. Um, we've saved a mother and baby. How do we, what are some of the things we need to be thinking about, you know, of s sustainability in a different context? Just your very brief thoughts before we close. Yeah. I'll, I'll use two examples. One of them is, the, of course, the issue of early childhood development but also, most importantly, the aspect of adolescent health. And I think WHO is still working around the standards for quality of care for adolescent health. But we have received at country level a lot of pressure from the adolescent health people and also for working on early childhood development on whether actually we can look beyond the survival issues and then look at the quality of issues, the developmental issues. So we have a small group at country level actually, which is trying to work out some key indicators, looking at the quality of care, because this is definitely going to become very important. Even for newborns, when you resuscitate them, having a system which can actually follow up these babies to know what type of people are surviving is very important. Mm. So there's a small group which is trying to identify a few indicators as we wait for WHO guidance. Mm -hmm to have these indicators incorporated. Yeah. Thank you, I wanted Dr. also to comment briefly about the, the issue of DHIS2. I think the most important indicators which can be aligned to quality of care may not be picked through the DHIS2. Mm. They need to be qualitative, some of them, and some of them you need to have exit <coughs> interviews, but also some of them you need to make sure that there's somebody to verify the processes. Mm. So we need to use different mm. methods to collect the data. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sabidi. Unfortunately, we're at time for the panel. Um, and thank you for our pan to our panelists for sharing your incredible work um, from all three countries. I'm sure that all of you will agree with me that you've demonstrated aspirational goals, um, practical implementation, and the achievement of measurable improvements. You have definitely kept your eyes on the stars and your feet on the ground. <laughs> And I'm now going to hand over to Lily Kuck, who will be moderating panel two. Lily is the team lead for newborn health um, uh, at, the at the Office of Maternal Child Health and Nutrition for USAID. Lily is passionate about quality of care. And I know that this is going to be a fascinating panel. Thank you for being with us. That was a wonderful panel. And uh, we're going to have something a little different next. And I look forward to uh, moderating the next panel. It is an honor for me to moderate this panel. Uh, we've just heard examples of how three countries are implementing programs at the country level to improve quality of care at scale. In this panel, we will move up to the global level and see how it all comes together at the country level. We will hear about key priorities from the perspective of country, regional, and global stakeholders, and the catalytic role that development partners may play to strengthen quality of care in countries. I want to begin with uh, a quote that I just heard, Hakuna Macheso. <laughs> <laughs> That's Swahili, right? Yeah. My first Swahili, actually my second Swahili phrase. Hakuna Macheso, it means no more games. This is serious business. I had learned a couple of other Swahili words before. You all might have seen Lion King. <laughs> Hakuna Matata. It means don't worry, be happy. <laughs> so I think it's time now to actually worry a bit uh, and really say this is serious business. And we, it's no time for games. Uh, so thank you for teaching me some Swahili words. So it is my pleasure to introduce the panelists. Uh, we have Dr. Blerta Maliki. 
uh, who's from WHO, and she's the coordinator of the Quality of Care uh, MNCH network. Then we have Dr. Margaret Crook, associate professor at Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health and also chair of the Lancet Commission on High Quality Health Systems in the SDG era. Dr. Soji Soji Teddy, exec executive director, Africa Region, Institute for Healthcare Improvement. And I welcome Dr. Jessica Sabiti back again on this panel. And you know, she's the commissioner of maternal and child health with the Ministry of Health in Uganda. So a little bit about this format. Uh, we're going to do this differently. There will be no presentations. It's going to be a moderated discussion. I will begin with a round of questions, and then that will be followed by an interactive discussion among the panelists where they will ask questions of each other. And then we'll open it up for questions from the audience. OK, let's begin the first round of questions that I will ask. Uh, let me begin with a question for Dr. Margaret Crook. Dr. Crook, Crook um, the Lancet Global Health Commission on High Quality Health Systems was launched earlier this month. In fact, it was launched 10 days ago. As a lead commissioner, you and the other commissioners had the opportunity to review extensive evidence and convene some of the brightest minds in health systems improvement. Can you provide us with a brief snapshot of the Commission's findings and recommendations and what you see as the key implications for improving RMNCH health care at scale in low resource settings? Thank you. Thank you so much, Lily, for that uh, rapidly answerable uh, question. Um, <laughs> glad I have a half hour. Um, really um, excited to be with you today for this discussion. Um, as, as Lily mentioned, uh, the commission, which is a two-year effort among 30 uh, commissioners worldwide and a dedicated secretariat, really dug into this question of, of what do we mean by quality? What does it look like for people every day in low- and middle-income countries, and how can we change? And so um, we started really with this quite simple notion that health systems are a key determinant of population health and that we know already that access to good health services can save lives on a mass scale. But that conversely, the lack of access to high quality health systems wastes lives. How many lives? Well, we estimated that 8.6 million lives every year are lost due to a lack of access to high quality care. So let's just think about that for a second. 8.6 million people die from conditions that are treatable by health systems today. We're not talking about extremely advanced care. These are SDG conditions that the globe has agreed should be within reach of all countries in the next several decades. Of the 8.6 million lives lost, 5 million today are lost among people who have already reached out to the health system. They've sought care. They're in care. And yet they are dying unnecessarily. And these are deaths due to poor quality, which is the reason we're all here today. So the commission, uh, when we saw these numbers, really took a step back to redefine what we mean by high quality health systems. If they're truly to be a determinant of health, what does it take? And we started with, a, with the notion that health systems are first and foremost for people. Um, they are about people, they're for people, they need to be completely focused on the well-being, the trust, and the confidence of people. And we see health systems, high quality health systems, as having three key functions. They need to produce and protect health. They need to engender, generate trust and confidence in the population. And they need to be able to change and adapt when health needs change and people's preferences change and technology changes. They've got to change. They are not static entities. And so you can see from this definition that health systems to us are not just a health producing institution, but also a social institution with responsibilities for better health, but also confidence. Um, and also, the commission concluded that we need to really raise our standards. In fact, our collective ambition has for too long been too low and that we should be judging health systems on their performance, um, particularly in the areas of care competence and people's experience, and also on the impact of systems on lives saved, on suffering reduced, 
on trust and economic benefits for families. We all know, I'm a doctor first, that stethoscopes, that antibiotics, that vaccines matter. But they don't, don't themselves equate to good quality. We have to stop measuring inputs and calling that quality. And we found in our investigation pretty broad and deep gaps in competence and outcomes. Those things that I just mentioned really matter. Um, let me just give you a few examples relevant to maternal newborn child health. Uh, for example, we found that fewer than half of mothers receive a visit from a trained provider within an hour of giving birth in a health facility. What's the point of going to a health facility if your provider doesn't check on you to diagnose that postpartum hemorrhage which develops postpartum and must be diagnosed and identified early for treatment to succeed? In fact, the figure half was a recurring theme in our, in our investigation and in our analysis. Half of needed clinical actions are done in a typical antenatal care visit. This is a routine type of care that we've known about for 50 years. Half of parents leave a sick child visit knowing the diagnosis. And overall, about half of maternal deaths are directly attributable to lack of access to high quality care. So, you know, when we look at this in totality, it's like health systems are flying with only one engine. It's difficult to believe they're going to get us there. They're going to get us to the SDGs. They're going to get us to the grand promises of universal health coverage if we don't take quality seriously. And so where do we go from here? We spent quite a lot of time looking at solutions, looking at approaches, ways of thinking. Um, and because health systems are complex adaptive systems, they're not linear machines where simple inputs translate directly into desired outputs, the solutions uh, do not lie on the surface. That is where the problems are apparent, but the solutions lie elsewhere. Um, and indeed, we uh, felt as a commission that we needed to overhaul our approach to improvement. Um, and that meant moving from individual providers and a clinic at a time or small pilots of clinics to consider the roots of health systems and, and actually look outside of the health system to think about how to transform the experience and the outcomes of people. Um, yeah, I'm sure you've heard the phrase that every system is perfectly designed to get the results it gets. And so if we want different results, we need different systems. Uh, so the commission identified, really looked, by the way, extensively at the literature on quality improvement strategies uh, and on complex adaptive systems and what does it take to change. And we identified four universal actions, actions that we think are pertinent in most settings, and we think that every country should have a look uh, at these. They will look different in every setting. But the themes, we think, are very relevant uh, universally. So the first of these is governing for quality. Uh, the essence of health system governance should be quality. It's sort of the basic proposition of the system. We're not there to cut hair or to sell shoes. We're there to make people better. And the only way to do that is to have our clients get the quality that they deserve. And so you need a unified focus strategy for sure. And I'm delighted that Blerta is here. And WHO has been a wonderful partner in the commission and in working on a, on a national quality uh, strategy that's so critical. But we don't just need paper. We need leaders who are willing to carry the torch for this. And I was so happy to hear in Uganda that the prime minister, even at that level, has acknowledged the key responsibility of the health system to provide that, that standard of good care. And that's actually the ideal situation. That's where we want it. We don't want a quality director over on the side and some small, poorly lit room running quality for the health system. It's got to start right at the top. Um, and it also requires a humility and a desire to learn, a, a willingness to acknowledge errors are made, that not every worker is actually fabulous. Some workers need to, to be assigned to different tasks. Other workers need to be uplifted and supported. Um, but that systems need accountability, and someone should be accountable for it at the end, and we need that person to be a high-level person. Um, service, the second universal action is service redesign. So systems have uh, historically been organized to maximize people's access to care, which comes for very good reason. Originally, systems were not accessible to rural populations, and so many countries started building clinics, and they've done a great job. When we map clinics, as the commission did in many countries, we see that uh, countries like Uganda, Tanzania, others have done a great job in bringing clinics very close to the door of people. Not, not perfect, and they're still underserved areas, Zambia, other places with remote areas. 
but we've done a decent job. And actually, politicians have come to love this. This is a reliable vote getter, cutting ribbons on clinics. Uh, and I think the question we need to be asking is, it's time to shift from maximizing access to maximizing outcomes. And that means that these clinics that are there, assets on the ground, as I heard someone refer to earlier, may need different functions to be able to maximize the health of the populations. So for example, why are deliveries being done in small facilities without any real or realistic recourse to advanced care should the mom run into problems? We all know that a woman who's bleeding or seizing in a remote rural clinic, even with a dedicated midwife, which is not always guaranteed, will be there cannot really get to that C-section or that, or that uh, advanced intervention for herself or her newborn in, in any time to save her life. It's just not, not happening. So we need to be moving deliveries to the place that can uh, get them done properly and respectfully for the woman without incurring an epidemic of C-sections. I think there are lots of examples to learn from that incorporate, for example, midwives and obstetricians working side by side with generalists, with care teams. Uh, lots of ways to do that, but let's make survival first, survival and respect first and foremost in our considerations, not proximity. And this is why we need better roads and better transport and, and the private sector to all join hands and work on this together. It's not just the health system alone. Margaret, this, we're running short on time. Sure. Thanks. So the third universal action is transforming the workforce. Um, we don't think that in-service training is really cutting it. Uh, we do need to update uh, and urgently the, care, the training curricula for doctors and nurses, as well as their clinic environment and their leadership and management and pay. And the fourth opportunity for improvement, fourth universal action, is to enlist the people themselves to demand more quality. One of the biggest surprises for us in the commission was the high marks that people give to objectively poor quality care. And we think this stems from lack of empowerment, but also lack of information of what good quality care looks like, and frankly, lack of exposure to it in many settings. So we think this is a, another really underappreciated opportunity to, to put pressure on systems in constructive ways to improve performance all around. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You thought seven minutes was too short. They've actually been given only four minutes each, so a lifetime work of work boiling it down to four minutes is <laughs> no easy task. Thank you. Uh, moving on to uh, my next question is for Dr. Jessica Sabiti. Uh, Dr. Sabiti, Margaret Crook has outlined four universal actions recommended by the Commission including the recommendation that health system leaders need to govern for quality by ad adopting a shared vision of quality care, a clear quality strategy, strong regulation, and continuous learning. As a Ministry of Health official who has supported countrywide RMNCH quality efforts for many years in Uganda, can you please reflect on what this recommendation means to you and share learning from the Uganda context? Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. I'd like to begin by highlighting a risk, I think, which countries are facing in the push for universal health care coverage. I think many countries are still struggling, of course, coming from the MDGs, on translating what universal health care coverage is. I sit in several meetings and I look at the leaders struggling with a diagram, with a, you know, <laughs> And I think it's very important at this point for us to go back and make sure that quality is centered very well yeah, and, and translate this in a very simple way. Having said that, I think for leaders to govern quality of care, I think it's very important that we change our approach in addition to centering quality of care and making sure that quality of care is not only a service, but it's a right, it's an equity issue, it's an accountability issue, that we bring everybody on the table. We need to engage in a meaningful way. For example, when we talk about adolescent health, most people look at people, vulnerable populations, as people who need, as beneficiaries. When are we going to bring these people as experts on the table? And I think that's the biggest challenge in countries. Partners and donors don't want to fund these processes because they don't bring quick results. And even countries don't also monitor this. Uh, processes. They don't even invest money in looking at these perspectives. So I think the issue of meaningful engagement, having bottom-up approach, having citizens' voices and getting the, their perspective on the table 
is going to be a new thing for countries to do. And uh, the other thing is also to make sure that we are using data. Many countries have difficulty using data or getting very good data. And even when they get good data, sometimes they may not use the data for, some, for many other reasons. So investing more money in data, having a data, bo a data reform process going on in countries, especially routine data, for me, I think it's going to be a very important thing. Instead of waiting for data for five years, DHI, as I said earlier on, is very good. But we need to have other processes which can capture and make our work responsive to what people are seeing and what they are feeling. We need also to think carefully about local adaptation. In Uganda, Uganda is well known for adopting interventions. If you have a new initiative and you want to try it, go for Uganda. <laughs> I think countries need to go back and think through how we adapt and invest more money to understand how interventions are brought to countries, how they flow into the countries, who brings them, who was there, who prepared for them, and who consented. So I think the whole issue of adaptation is very important. And WHO in the old days used to invest in adaptation. But if you look at increasingly most of the initiative, there's no time for adaptation. Right now, WHO has released the Code of Care Standards. They have 136 or something measures. And we're struggling. They're all important. Some people say, oh, everything is important. So when you try to challenge and say, let's do some few things, some people disregard that. So we need support. We need to nurture these processes and we need to work with our leaders. We need to build capacity in the local leaders and we need to believe in bottom-up approaches in country and also working with partners. Engage in a meaningful manner. Let the community become an expert. Let everybody become an expert. And let's work within our resources. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sabiti. Uh, my next question would be for Dr. Soji. Uh, Dr. Soji, you have significant boots on the ground experience improving healthcare wearing different hats as a clinician, as a member of a hospital management team, as a quality improvement coach and practitioner, as a leader of a QI initiative at national scale in Ghana, and now as IHI's Executive Director for Africa. Based on your real-world experience and your current role supporting healthcare improvement across the African continent, what does it take to improve healthcare at scale, and how can partners best support governments in this journey? Thank you very much, Lily. Um, I'd just like to start by saying that this is really an auspicious year for quality. When some of us started doing this work over 10 years ago, I don't think that we had this kind of global momentum. So the three reports that have been issued this year, I think, provide an important focus point for the conversations that we are currently having. I'd just like to start talking about the quality strategy, which is called out very clearly in the Lancet Commission report. And I think the experience is that there's wide variability in the kinds of quality strategies that the various countries are working with. There are those that do not have that overarching strategy, and there are those whose strategies are very high level, very aspirational. And I think the need really is to be able to have detailed implementation plans that show very clearly how those national aspirations can be cascaded down to the regional and then to the facility levels. So the, the, that is key. And I'm saying this because IHI is just coming to the end of five country case studies that we, had, we, we have just done. Um, Nigeria, Ghana, Scotland, Mexico, and Ethiopia. These are countries that we've supported at the level of the ministry to develop and are now implementing quality strategies. The second thing is that it is important, as the Lancet Commission points out, that um, we need strong regulation, we need learning, um, we need good accreditation systems. But I think what needs to be emphasized is that it is not so much the existence of these initiatives which are often cast as separate, disconnected you know, initiatives that the countries will pursue. What is more important is how we coordinate these separate activities to be able to achieve those population health outcomes, which is why these days we are talking about a quality management system. In other words, what are the governance structures at the national and subnational levels that can be able to tie the gaps together, help to prioritize, 
help to commission teams at various levels of the health system and help them to be able to drive those improved health outcomes. Because without that systematic governance, we really would not be able to get the, the outcomes that we are looking for. Leadership is key, but leadership is not just at the national level. It's in the hospitals, it's in the communities, and all of these people need to be brought on board. So currently what we are advocating for is that when we even talk about quality management teams, community members need to be active members of those teams. And I know sometimes that makes health professionals a little bit uncomfortable, that they would get to know trade secrets or, or whatever, I don't know. But really that is, that is where we should be heading for. And that really links up to the fourth recommendation about stimulating population demand. So the conversation is, can we create mobile applications where when people visit facilities similar to what happens in the hospitality industries, people can give direct feedback. Um, there are conversations in places like Ghana where we are talking about creating league tables to show who is performing well in areas of trust, um, confidence in the, in the health facilities. Um, they are talking about community scorecards where we would have focus groups in various communities so that there'll be direct feedback to the facilities, not in a judgmental way, but as a sort of cooperative mechanism. You raise the issue also of partnerships and how we can work as funders and as partners in these communities. Um, what I would say is that there's a need for some humility on the part of funders and, and partners, because a lot of the time you would have partners and funders coming into these countries very high and mighty. They've scoped the country. They know what the problem is. They have prepackaged interventions. <laughs> and they want people to adopt these things wholesale without realizing that you cannot wait till six months to the end of your project before you start asking who is going to sustain these interventions. <laughs> these conversations ought to have started at the beginning when we were designing the intervention. So co-design, co-implementation, very, very key you know, tenets that we would need to take on board. I had the singular misfortune of working with a funder in a country where funding was almost cut because the accusation was that we, as IHI, were paying too much attention to the ministry. So the question is, as funders and as partners, the question needs to be asked. Do you want a pilot project with breakthrough results, publish your, your, your publication in your journal, and then you go away? Or do you really want a sustainable intervention that is owned by the country and that is integrated into their systems? And I think this question ought to be answered very early. Um, there's also the issue of um, harvesting best practices. Really, um, Dr. Ongwe talked about learning on a small scale, documenting what is working, and then rapidly scaling up. Um, these countries are not coming from pure deficits. I mean, there are assets in these countries, things are working in multiple places, but in many places we are struggling with ability to really harness what is working in a systematic way to inform what is happening at national scale. And I think there's a lot of opportunity to do this. We have our, our half-year review meetings, monthly review meetings that are happening, hospital meetings are happening. So we would just need to be more deliberate about harvesting these best practices and promoting them at national scale. And where best practices are concerned, I think of them mainly in two ways. There's the content, and then there's the process. In terms of the content, I see that there's a lot of attention to what did you do differently to be able to get the results. So what is the innovation? And that is the content. But I see that there isn't much attention to the process. What changed in the workings of the health system to make this outcome possible? So sometimes people want to take the innovation, but they do not want to change this, the way the health system works. You know, if it took us monthly side visits, coaching and mentoring supporting visits to be able to get the results, what makes you think that in the routine system, <laughs> visiting them half yearly, would get you those results. And how can we change the workings of the health system to be able to support this new of work? I think these are some of the critical questions that need to be addressed if we want to get the outcomes we are looking for. Thank you so much. Uh, rapidly moving along to the last question, uh, to Dr. Uh, Blerta Maliki, WHO. Uh, Blerta, over the last couple of years, the WHO published, uh, sorry, established a quality of care framework for MNCH and has launched a country-centered quality of care network for MNCH in nine countries. Can you briefly tell your, our audience about the network and um, why WHO established it? What was the rationale behind it? Uh, what is being learned through it? 
and what are the challenges and opportunities and future priorities of the network? Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Lily, uh, and thank you for the invitation to be part of this uh, panel. It's very important, not for WHO, but for the momentum we are living around quality of care, to be able to talk about how we work together, why we're working together to address quality, and what is the biggest challenge in this quality world that we are so excited about it. Uh, before I go into any details about the network, I would like to thank, I think, most of the organizations in this room. And the reason for thanking them is that USAID, with a number of organizations, with a myriad of, org of organizations, in the past 20 plus years, at least in my professional history, has invested heavily in looking at what quality means and how to improve quality of care for health systems at large and maternal newborn child health specifically. So I cannot not mention MCSP for the last four or five years that has been a champion, a challenger, and a positive supporter of this agenda. SNL and Save the Children, who are continuing the same legacy in terms of quality of care. MSH, that is now like one of the major, major supporters of quality historically, not only today. Or other organizations, URC Assist, and I can, I may, I'm sure, Jay Paigo, uh, I am sure I'll forget all of them. But uh, I think this is important to recognize that a lot has been happening in the past. A lot has been learned about what quality is and how to go about quality. And the challenges that were placed to WHO, I would say before, well before commissions or reports, this is towards the end of, SDG, of uh, MDGs, when we were clear that coverage was improving, availability and accessibility of services was enhancing, but the results, morbidity, mortality, and equity wasn't changing with the same pace. So what does it mean? Why for maternal and newborn health is so challenging to get into the results we want? And it was at that moment when uh, the challenge was posed to WHO, end of 2013-14, saying what you as an organization are doing to help countries to move, to shift from this thinking of only get to everybody and to get to everybody with what it is needed in the moment it is needed in the appropriate way. That was translated into the standards which helped us as an organization and the entire global public health community to articulate guide, moving from guidelines into the without implementation. And that is where the beauty of the moment comes because having standards doesn't mean that standards will be implemented by themselves. How do you move into an implementation of such an ideal world, for many people still aspirational world, was the question that was thrown at us. And the question wasn't just not only that, it was how do you do this in a way that is sustainable at scale? How do you implement quality of care everywhere in the same and in the same way. So that was a question that was behind the establishment of the network, which uh, happened, I would say, as a momentum in February 2017. But as a process, it started well before that moment. We did have, uh, we, we are privileged to work with this myriad of partners, and we are privileged to work with countries that have already uh, a good experience in a good or bad or good experience in terms of trying to address quality of care. So Dr. Jeska is one of the representatives of the nine countries in the network, Uganda and Nigeria. We already heard two experiences that come from these two ends in terms of what it mean, meant for them to start engaging and to pack what already was happening in their situations and context in a way that was looking at what does it mean to build institutions, what does it mean to build systems that support quality, not anymore as a project or as a one point on time, but as something, as a function that the system has to deliver all the time routinely. And I think this is one of the biggest shifts that we are looking and is a challenge for us altogether because people look at quality as a goal, aspirational goal or objective. And we do not think about this has to be delivered and has to be delivered throughout. So uh, the network was established as such in 2017. Uh, nine initial countries, two are already in the room, and seven other countries, mainly in sub-Saharan Africa, India and Bangladesh are outside that uh, region. And now uh, we are looking at Kenya and Sierra Leone as two additional newcomers into the network. Uh, collectively, we sat, down, we sat down and we said, what does it mean for us to do this work in a way that is sustainable and at scale? That translated into the strategic objectives of the network. I would really invite you to look at those four strategic objectives. In a nutshell, is leadership, action, learning, and accountability. And this is well before the commission recommendations came in, into which the leadership is about 
governing, institutionalizing quality of care throughout the health system and supporting it. Action is about bringing more than only quality improvement or packages, already packaged interventions into the world of RMNCH or even broader. Learning is the piece that brings together data and information with the how to, what is that best practice and that innovation that is worth and how do you go for that innovation at scale without forgetting the processes and not just singling out one innovation but the entire way how you do it. And accountability which moves mainly towards not only demonstrate and be accountable but create those elements and forums in which you can demonstrate that accountability, in which Qualities articulated together with women, children, and the communities where they belong, so you are accountable toward what, towards what your community needs. The implementation of this type of approach is now ongoing in these nine countries. I think I would be more specific in saying what they've done, because it has been very... Um, Dr. Jessica, she already uh, hinted into the different ways on how this is happening at the countries. But the most important was that recognition that this were not starting from scratch, recognition that nobody knows the exact answer to this question and that we need to sit together and co-produce. So bringing together all the stakeholders and partners under the leadership of a government, full thorough ownership and leadership from the national government and the same type of leadership and ownership being translated into the subnational down to the facility level. So looking at who's doing what, identifying gaps, looking at the different packages of implementation around quality of care, bringing the experience of a system and looking very clearly at countries having established or aiming to establish their national strategies on quality that is beyond a paper, structures that look at the quality and then how that links with the programs. Countries are now at the implementation stage, and there are many challenges that are coming with implementation, including uh, already we had some preconceived answers in, in the network and uh, among all of us saying we know how to go about it. And now we're finding out that we know how to go about it in different ways, in different manners. So how can we synthesize or bring this together in a way that makes sense for different contexts and gives the country the opportunity to contextualize, not to go with one model that fits all. The second biggest challenge we have is measurement. And I don't want to go into all the comments around measurement, but it's important to identify that the measurements of quality are important at all levels. Not everything is important in each level. So where quality is improved at the point of delivery, when the woman or the child meets the provider, that is where you will need a myriad of measurements that will tell you how your practice is changing, what is happening, and then you can improve one by one, bit by bit as you go. At the district level, you need a change in thinking around quality and those tracers that will tell you how it moves. And then the national level, you need to be more strategic. A lot of work MCSP is doing and is co-leading around the monitoring and evaluation working group of the uh, network, together with other organizations in the, uh, in the network, especially on the, on the learning and the implementation. Um, I think I'll stop here because there is no more time. I didn't yeah. have two more things to say. <laughs> oh, I didn't even know Thank there was you. a clock there. <laughs> In fact, um, <laughs> I've just been informed we've run out of time. And we, we did have a plan to have an interactive session where the panelists would ask each other questions, but I don't think we have time for that. But I have been allowed one uh, sort of a redesigned format for this. I will end with one question. We will have a little bit of time for the uh, open Q&A from the audience. But before we do that, uh, let me just ask one question, a burning question that I had. And I would ask uh, anyone from the panelists. I would also invite Dr. Anwe from Nigeria uh, to also respond if you like. This question is about uh, really uh, sustainability. Um, you know, I want, to, I want to remind you what Barbara had said in the opening remarks about uh, the buzzword at USAID is journey to self-reliance. And another way of saying that is sustainability, which we have been saying it all along. So, uh, you know, we have all as international development partners gone to countries, provided technical assistance, and we know of cases where things fall apart when we leave. And there are many reasons for that. So um, I would like to focus on that one question instead of having this interactive discussion among the panelists. And anyone who would like to respond, I would really like to hear from the countries especially. And Dr. Soji, you have a lot of country experience, even though you're working as a development partner. 
so if you could sort of reflect on uh, the sustainability of all this work that we're doing, you know, uh, is it really sustainable? Do we have to work in a different way if it's not sustainable? And what would that different way look like? So let me stop there with that question and anyone can respond. Thank you. Dr. Anwe, please uh, also. Thank you very much, Lily. Uh, sitting down and listening to these panelists, I have moved back to Nigeria and come back. <laughs> and the simple reason is that um, quality of care is not new, yes. But systematic implementation of quality of care, the way we are going about it, is new to many countries, especially Nigeria. I see it as MCSP is midwifing the process. I have just given birth to a new baby. <laughs> and then um, I think that it will take time for the system to internalize it, integrate it into our system, and then make it sustainable. And you know, it involves a lot of things. One, um, Nigeria is just developing her second national strategic health development plan. And it's good, I think, for Ebony State. There are a lot of things bordering on quality of care that has been integrated into that plan. Fine. But you know, that is just the first phase. And most of the time, it's good to have <laughs> the strategic plan. It's good to have everything. In the last three years, we reviewed the previous strategic development plan, the level of implementation, February State was just 29% implementation level. So even when some of these have been captured in, in the country's uh, strategic plan, it still takes time for implementation to actually be achieved. So the core message I'm sending is that um, quality of care is not as old as we think in our settings. And we need to really think of how to make it work. Because we need more time for people to understand what it means, especially at the higher level. Those are the people that will strategically take the decision. At the state level, if no matter how good the commissioner, the permanent secretary understands it, no matter how beautiful the document is, if the governor does not buy into it, you won't have fund. You will not have fund. And getting these messages across all the levels will take time. And particularly in Nigeria, I'm worried because MCSB closed out is coming during a political transition period. So, and we don't even know, assuming Lily stands up now to say, let me go and talk to that person. He will, she will, the person will listen. He may convince my governor today. And by February, there is a new governor sworn in. And we start afresh. So there are so many issues. So, but the bottom line is, yes, we are going there. But it's a long journey, and we have just started. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's a long journey, that journey to self-reliance. And that road is full of potholes. <laughs> <laughs> Should we have one more response from here, and then we'll open it up for uh, uh, general Q&A? OK, well, I'll, I'll share something. I think that sometimes we don't pay sufficient attention to the internal decision-making processes of the respective countries. Um, and if we do, and the, the decisions around the agenda setting and how we prioritize are embedded within those decision-making processes, they stop becoming the decisions of partners but the country's own decision. And I'll give you an example. Where in Ghana, when we started this whole conversation around developing a quality strategy, we could have gone in as the Institute for Healthcare Improvement and had the conversation and put it out in that manner. But we made sure that the conversations ended up in the need for a quality strategy being captured in the medium-term strategy and being escalated to the health summit. So at the end of the day, in a communique that was issued by the ministry, the ministry itself said that it needed to develop a quality strategy. That meant that it had been taken out of our hands. And immediately it got into that communique, it meant that it had to be reported on annually to the stakeholders in the country. So it was embedded in the technocratic system, 
and it meant that it would go irrespective of who was driving it. The second issue has to do with funding. I think quality and all the things we're talking about sometimes require funds. The reason why sometimes coaching and mentoring support and visits cannot happen at the same frequency is because there's no funding to buy fuel and take them to the sites. You know, so a careful conversation needs to be had for us to come to the realization that it costs money as well. And for the governments to be able to budget, you know, even if the small budget. So now that's really what we are doing. At the beginning of the conversation, can you also put something on the table as a government, as a country? Even if it's a venue that you are going to provide free of charge, it's a contribution. And then as we get to the end of the project, it becomes clear that the country's own funding also um, increases. The last is capacity building, not assuming that people know how to do all of these things, um, but to be systematic in the way we build capacity. But even as we build capacity, to de -jargonize. not push lean and six sigma and model for improvement, <laughs> but to understand that the core concepts are basically the same, and to focus on those core concepts as opposed to pushing some particular methods down the throats of the poor ministries. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah. So I'm really sorry to say that, you know, I would have loved to hear from the other panelists as well. There's so much wisdom and expertise here. Um, but we have really run out of time. And But we do want to give the audience maybe two or three questions. How many are we allowed? Sorry? Three. Three. Okay. Three. And maybe we'll take one of those questions from the overflow room. Um, so two from here. Uh, anyone wants to go first? None? Uh, maybe we can have that interactive session. <laughs> so here's a question for Dr. Sabiti from the overflow room. Is this for now? This yes. uh, Okay. So let me start with this while you're, some, uh, you're thinking about a question for any of the panelists. So Dr. Sabiti, here's a question for you that came from the overflow room. It says, the quality strategy in Uganda is impressive. However, is the data presented and the programs discussed only at the Ministry of Health facilities and public facilities, or does this program and initiative also include the many private not-for-profit facilities in Uganda? Private sector question, very good. Yeah. yeah, thank you very much. I think that's a very good question because that is one of the areas we've been struggling. The data we have been collecting in the five districts, for example, using the WHO standards, includes both public and private facilities. In some districts, we have so many private facilities. And the discussion which is going on now, whether we should sample a few of them. The biggest problem we have had is a historical problem where the private facilities do not contribute to the health information system. And uh, starting from about three years ago, there's been a process of trying to make sure that the private facilities also contribute data. But there is no incentive, there's no, even the utilization of the data is not very effective, so we still have a long journey to go. So it's true, not all the private facilities are included. We have started slowly, but we still have a big way to go. In terms of percentage, I would say less than 50% or even much lower. Not yet. Thank you. Is there any question from the audience? Yeah, I see one hand up. I see two. OK, we'll take those two. Hi, my name is Grace McLean. I'm a health uh, research and evaluation officer at International Rescue Committee. And I'm curious if anyone has any experience or insights into applying these quality improvement initiatives in a humanitarian or emergency context. Um, so trying to make sure that the alignment of the stars isn't totally derailed in a disaster or a conflict situation. Thank you. Thank you. Great question. Uh, Troy, you get the last question. I was, uh, I was hesitating. I'm Troy Jacobs, uh, USAID. Um, and when we were talking about, I mean, Paul Batalden had a recent commentary about co-production. And we we're talking about sort of co-production at one level, but there is a flow of, of knowledge, learning, and what I don't see is we've got expertise in low and middle income countries, 
And we are sitting today in a place like Washington, D.C., where we have quality of care issues. Um, I mean, some of the indicators are just as bad as in Africa. And to change the relationship, the flow of information, the expertise, so that in fact, we have experts in these countries that are informing high-income countries in the same way, as co-equals. Um, what do we need to do to change that type of co-production? Great. Thank you. Wow. <laughs> so um, who would like to take the question about hum the humanitarian context? And for the co-production, I was wondering whether, Margaret, you'd like to respond to that? or Sure. Okay. Great. So humanitarian context, anyone feels comfortable uh, responding to that question? Yeah, I can't, I can't try to, to answer that question, but just to warn you that in Uganda we have uh, adopted a very unique uh, humanitarian model, especially for the refugee setups, is that our refugees actually are incorporated in the host communities. So it's slightly different, but in some districts you find that actually you can they are still in the refugee setup, some of them, but we have adopted a model which is inclusive, and that means it has both effects on the refugees themselves and the host communities. But we are working with UNICEF in those districts to develop systems and set this cult of care in place. Interestingly, the same standards and the same processes actually apply because they're the same values and standards, and that's what we are trying to foster. The only problem is that we are also trying to make sure that the host communities are not marginalized. We've seen situations where you have piped water passing through the host communities and going to the refugee camp, and the host community doesn't have enough food. We've seen refugee communities come and settle in a place, and they clear the whole forest. Or they're, they're given land, and the local people don't have the land. So again, the same model is applicable, but I think it's also opening up our eyes that actually when you have such situation, doesn't mean that actually the humanitarian crisis people are worse off always than the, those who are better off than the, the host communities. So it's also helping us to balance, and we're using the same model. Thank can, you. Can I only say that yeah. we are, we, it is one of the areas of work that we would like to work on it. We have started yeah. a little bit. So if anyone is interested, please see me after this end. Great. Yeah. 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 All right, Margaret, do you want to take the last question? Sure, thank you for that question. Uh, and let me um, both endorse and also dissent from parts of your comment. <laughs> um, so where I would uh, dissent is in, I think, a false equivalence between the problems we have here in the US and in um, high-income countries, and frankly, the problems that I have uh, witnessed, but, but really colleagues around this table um, live with daily in rural and urban settings in the lowest income countries. I, I think we it's become quite popular to say we all have struggles, and that's true. Uh, we have huge inequities in this country that are absolutely insupportable and immoral, I would say. But they are, uh, they are not equivalent to the uh, challenges that uh, women and men face daily in Uganda, in Tanzania, countries um, that uh, some of us are, are very familiar with, others much more so. Um, so I think um, it is not helpful to paint them all with the same brush. Um, in terms of the health uh, system experts, uh, I couldn't agree more. I think it should be our uh, joint ambition to, to support and create and build the type of health system science workforce, frankly, that can do the hard analyses, that can inform, that can provide the data, that can support the Ministry of Health, which frankly every day doesn't have the time nor the resources to be digging in and understanding trends and confidence intervals and, and, and you name it. And I think those folks exist already. They're wonderful universities and countries. Other people exist, maybe working, already exist, focused on perhaps slightly different areas whom we could redirect and engage in this, in this struggle, in this revolution on quality. And then others still need to be supported and developed and, and mentored over time. And one thing I do know is it is not fixed with a week-long STATA training course. It is not fixed with uh, conference calls where we drop uh, off every few minutes. But it is fixed with, an, with, a, with, a, with a sustained and respectful engagement over long periods of time that goes to master's level training, bachelor level training, 
and uh, doctoral level training to uh, to build up the, the kind of health uh, systems uh, research and data workforce that countries need. Thank you so much. Um, uh, we have really come to the end of our session. Uh, we don't have any more time. I would really like to thank this uh, wonderful panel of experts. I want to uh, repeat, uh, echo what I heard Margaret say, that it will take nothing short of a revolution to achieve the bold goals of the SDGs, and hakuna macheso. <laughs> <laughs> thank you all. Thank you, Margaret. Oh, and Koki uh, will uh, close the, the panel, and uh, she is, I think she needs no introduction. <laughs> She's the director of MCSP. I know we are out of time, so I thought actually I would tweet my reply, but I don't know if that will go down well with this audience. <laughs> so I just wanted to <clears throat> take a minute to thank all the speakers, the moderators, for this enriching and engaging discussion and thought-provoking dialogue we've had today and to the Woodrow Wilson Center for being such an amen, uh, immense and tremendous partner with us and uh, being such a great host with us. Uh, a big thanks to our MCSP communications team. I know that was not in my closing remarks, but I have to thank them for everything that they do to make these uh, sessions successful. The sharing and the learning that we've seen and heard this morning reflects both the complexity and the possibility of really driving quality agenda forward at scale. So it's exciting news but it's important that we implement a systems approach that brings together multiple stakeholders at different levels. Makes me so happy to see some of the results from the countries that's showing tremendous progress over time, uh, some of the countries that we visited and worked in. Through these two panels, I think it's very, very clear that we need to have um, the need to focus on a systems approach, look at the value and importance of leadership and governance and the favorable policy environment, Measuring what matters and measuring it better, the value of shared learning and teamwork to drive implementation at every level, and co-designing your intervention based uh, with, with the Ministry of Health and other partners based on the context. We see that countries are making exciting progress and achieving impressive results and milestones, but each country's context is different and unique as is their journey. As partners, we need to consider what it means to support the countries and um, have a country-driven and owned quality improvement. This time is right to think beyond pilots and to, do a, to think about sustaining system improvements at scale. Most importantly, we need to keep, keep our work people-centered at the core of what we do. So this is an iterative journey of doing, learning, improving, and uh, implementing. But ultimately, it's about doing the right thing, as we heard from Barbara at the beginning, at the right time and place for every person, every time. And as was stated before, achieving and sustaining gains in quality improvement is truly everyone's business. And we've seen from the discussion that this is um, really engaging and important. We are sorry we didn't have full time for a complete, uh, you know, taking everybody's questions. So we do hope that as MCSP and the partners that are involved, we continue the conversation. This is, a, as uh, Lily said, it's a long journey full of potholes, but we need to make sure that we are on the right road with all the partners. Thank you. <laughs>